Yay, first woman on the stage uh, as a speaker. Um, so that's fun. I'm just coming off of a um, less fun bout of food poisoning, which means I've had about a little less than 24 hours to uh, practice my slides. <laughs> so I've looked at all, it all lying down, but I think we'll be good today. This is me, more fun facts. <laughs> Um, so this is me uh, trying to do a pull-up, which I'm really, really, really bad at. Um, I also enjoy cheese and drama, preferably someone else's drama. Um, I think that most parties are really boring and I enjoy going to bed at 9 p.m. So probably won't see me Tuesday night at the party. <laughs> I'm going to talk about um, some UX stuff today, and I'm going to talk about some personal stuff today. And it all stems from the way that I think it's been working as a leader and as a UX designer post-pandemic, if you will, it's not really post, it's still quite a lot in the middle. Um, and I'm going to start by venturing into a little dangerous territory and say what we do as designers, and then I know at least 50% of you will disagree with me. <laughs> because we do a lot of different things. And it's quite hard to categorize, kind of like a design system, which you can't really explain that well. Um, but what we do as designers is, if you ask me, and, and you do, uh, we create excitement and we make someone's life a little easier or a little more fun or a little more efficient. And we like to stay on top and we like to advise on different directions in which we can take a design or an experience. Um, and we basically know how to create engagement and we know how to create feelings. That is, that is what we do. Um, but I mean, what if we don't? What if we are all a little rough around the edges and we, we don't really know how to do that? as well as we did two years ago. Um, because it's never been that easy staying on top. It's never been that easy being that advisor, walking into a room and saying, we know exactly where to move your business or how to create this product. And um, it's, just being, <laughs> it's just getting harder and harder in this almost post-pandemic situation. Um, so today, I'm going to walk you through two parts of my presentation. So the first one is we're going to have a look at the Danish COVID certificate app. I didn't build it. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I did use it a lot. Um, and then we're going to examine what I've learned from a really challenging project during the fall with um, a lot of my team. So that's the guys down here. They're all wearing t-shirts with my face on it, so you can contact them <laughs> afterwards and just fact check what I've said. Um, so they'll be in the lobby afterwards. Um, so I'm going to walk you through um, some things that I've learned and some things that I would definitely not do again. So let's talk about COVID. This is the official um, Danish COVID app. Um, and we've had a few, we've had a few options um, during the past two years. And my reason for bringing this today is I was wondering um, when I sort of looked through cases, who could have done this two years ago? Who could have explained to me that we would need something like this? That we would need an app to show someone our health status? Um, what would that situation look like? What would the app look like? Like right now, today, it sounds really simple, right? Because, you know, it's, it's right here, looks like this, makes sense. But two years ago, that was actually a really difficult situation because no one knew what that would be like. So if we have a closer look at the app, it's basically a, uh, a QR code. These are um, mock-ups, official mock-ups. So they're not like the final version. You'll get to see that in a few minutes. Um, it's also an international certificate, so that's quite practical. Um, the deal is you log in, you show the QR code to whoever needs to see it. That's basically it. 
In Denmark, we needed this for bars and restaurants, museums, public transport, even at some workplaces, so we, we used it a lot, all of us. Um, I, was, uh, I was kind of a late bloomer, because for some reason, whenever everyone does something, I kind of want to do the opposite. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we did have another version, it was this one. I used that for quite a while, longer than most people, because I was like, this works fine, it does the same job, and QR codes are stupid. So, <laughs> and they are, I mean, they're not cool. Um, so I used this for quite a while, but um, there, are, there are slight differences, but it, it, it does the job right. I mean, you can, you can see them I'm very well vaccinated, everything's good. Um, but, you know, then eventually I, um, I did jump on the, um, the bandwagon. So this is a very discreet um, screen capture of what it does. So this is actually my uh, COVID certificate. I'm not trying to prove anything. It was just a real, <laughs> I was just trying to do it for the, um, for the case study. Um, so my first thought was, all right, a giant QR code. That's really stupid. What are we going to do with this? What about if I have a really long name? What about if I don't have any network? You know, all these what about so that we always do or should do as designers. Um, so I spent a couple of weeks thinking that while still using the app because, you know, I kind of want it to go out as well. Um, and then the more I looked at it, the more I thought, well, what is this even, what is this even supposed to do? Like, why does it have all, all these little nifty features like the, um, the, the, the countdown or the counter at the bottom and all these gradients and, you know, the little, little fine details and the very official looking stamps. What is that all about even? So, um, and, and by the way, I, there we go. I almost locked myself out of my, my app because it's also very, um, um, what could I say? Well, it, it can detect if you're trying to cheat. So this is me trying to screenshot my app at first. And then what happens is I get this big warning that says you're trying to screenshot, you're not allowed to do that. And then I went, all right, all right. So I did it again. And then what happens is that you're locked out um, for about five minutes and you have to log back in. And I, just, I didn't have a got to do it a third time, so I don't, I don't know what happens. <laughs> but it's, um, it's very much not allowed to screenshot your app. And you can, you can figure out why, because you, know, you can sort of circulate screenshots from very vaccinated people to less vaccinated people. Um, and there are all these little subtle differences between the old one and the new one. The way that they signal, read me, this is important. The way that they use the official looking stamps and the um, sort of the, um, the, the, the police naming and everything. And um, I'm going to come back to this later on, but if you have a close look at these, both of them look kind of like a sort of passport, which is what we call it in Danish. So we call it the COVID passport. Um, I know that in English you probably say certificate, but there's a reason I think for why we call it a passport in Danish. But basically, in order to do this, or this, we needed this all of the time. And when trying to think back and say, right, so how do you actually create something like this? What is the use case? I was sort of, um, you know, when I was in the right frame of mind, I was like, all right, so maybe it's not, it's not actually the easy way to uh, come up with a giant QR code and then you sort it and then you just lazy designer who's basically done a QR code and who hasn't done that. But you can't really, until you have it in your hand, imagine an app that lets you have a beer with a friend or that, an app let, that lets you go to work. So this is so unfamiliar to us. We don't know how this is supposed to work. We don't know what is right and what is wrong. Um, and I was curious about why is that then? Because it seems so simple now that we have it. Of course, it looks like this, and it's easy to it's easy to show off, and it's easy to um, to understand. And then it dawned on me, well, why is it that we think this is so hard to grasp? 
and why it might be a little difficult to figure out how to do this. And it's because it's about us, basically. So we often say, at least I do as a, as a UXer, uh, we say, you are not your user. And then we flail our arms and we say it again and again and again because everyone thinks that they are. But in this case, you are your user. And you, you don't know how to react in a situation like this. We're not used to designing something that people have to use like this. We're not used to designing someone's social freedom, basically. So that's why it feels a little strange and unfamiliar. You could also say that this is not something that we have a mental model for. Because you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have been able to tell me two years ago what this would look like. So when we don't have a mental model, we try and create one. Or we try and get close to one. And personally, I think that's why if you look at the two screenshots, um, it looks like a passport. Because what is something that gives us access to something else? Looks kind of official. You're not allowed to copy it. Have it with you at all times. Well, that's an identification or a passport. So there you have it. Um, to me, that makes sense. That's why it's not um, a fun app with a giant check mark that changes color regarding whether you're uh, vaccinated or not. That's why it's got more text. That's why it's got official looking stamps because it is official looking. Um, it's something that needs to convey trust. It's something that needs to be easily scannable. If you're working at a bar, you, you want to be quite quick with checking people's uh, COVID passports. Otherwise, they'll leave again. And it needs to look quite official. I know that in Denmark, we have a really high degree of trust uh, in authority. So that might also be why we think this works really well and everyone just trusts it. Um, but at least that's also part of the reason, I think, because it's actually been made to look like something we trust already, like a passport. All right, so one thing is all the practicalities around trying to design things that you don't know about and trying to de design things that are meant to be used in a COVID setting. But another thing is all the feelings that we have as well. Um, I think a lot of us feel the burnout and maybe you have, or you just had the urge to just stand there and scream, I need a, I need a nap, I need to rest, I just, I, I want to go home. I don't, I don't want to be at work today, I just want to go home. Um, we've all had to adapt both professionally and personally at the same time. And that is actually really, really hard work. So um, I'm going to take you through some learnings that I did from a project um, that we did uh, in the fall of 21. But first up, I'll, um, I want to just touch upon the topic of checking in because that was very present throughout the project and it's still very present. And I think, you know, touching upon the topic of, you know, going, going back fully or, or not fully, checking in is really important, but what does it mean? Because it doesn't necessarily mean booking someone on Teams for 30 minutes. But you still have to talk to people, right? What does it even look like checking in when we're all at home in the box room <laughs> working on whatever we're working on? Um, if you ask me, it's making sure that you talk to people and not just about work. And I think this project made it quite clear to me how important it is to talk about other stuff as well and not just call someone up and say, well, how's work? How's it going? Are we making the deadline? Because yeah, we were mostly, most likely not, but there can be a million different reasons for that. All right, so we did this project um, for a major client. It was during the fall of 21, um, so that's the busiest time of year, at least for, um, for agencies in, uh, in Denmark. It was a major client and almost the entire team was involved some way or the other. Um, we had a 
sporty deadline, you could say, and we had a lot of stuff to do. Um, and it was basically um, every UXer and UI designer's dream. So we got to mature concepts, we got to create prototypes, we got to do a lot of user testing with global users. So you can basically wake any of us up at 3 a.m. and ask us to calmly explain where the share icon is in Teams. What does it look like? So it's a little arrow pointing upwards. And if you click it, you should be able to select the window that you would want to share with me. They weren't able to do that. <laughs> so we have some, um, some pretty interesting recordings of user testings. Um, but it was, um, it was fun and rewarding and really, really cool. But it was also just really, really hard work. There were, um, you could say, victorious days where everything was just perfect and everything went well. And then there were also days where, at least to me, it was a victory to just not cry in the bathroom. I made it through that day, and that was fine. Um, and I think it's very difficult to figure out how to help your colleagues when you yourself is a little bit unraveling, um, when all you need to do that day is just lean on something and listen to some country music and eat fries. So, <laughs> you know that feeling, right? You do. <laughs> you do that's, re that's really, I mean, you, you need to do that. So if you feel the urge, please do. But it's also kind of hard when you, when you need to carry someone else through as well. And I was sort of trying to look back and say, all right, so what did I take from this, apart from this overwhelming urge to uh, go into plumbing, or landscape gardening, or just rage quit on a Wednesday afternoon? Because I thought of all those things a lot, um, mainly because you know, plumbers and landscape gardeners, they seem to have, be having just a really nice time. I mean, they wear these, these sort of long, short things, and they have a lot of pockets, and they wear hoodies, and they just seem to be, <laughs> they just seem to be fine all of the time. And I wanted, I wanted to feel like that. I wanted to be fine all of the time, and I kind of also wanted to wear a hoodie more than I did. Um, and, well, I've let the idea go because I'm useless with my hands, <laughs> and it actually takes quite a while to become a plumber. You don't just do that. Um, so. Then I sat down and I tried to figure out then what, what else did I take from this project? Because I, I'm not going to be a plumber, I'm not going to be a landscape gardener, but what am I actually going to do differently? Um, what am I going to stop doing? Um, and I think the number one thing I learned is that it's so important to be aware of how you show up. This is not just a fancy way of saying fake it till you make it, which is um, kind of bullshit, if you ask me, because there's no such thing. Um, but this is being aware of the impact that you bring, whether it's in person or whether it's on Teams. Um, if you know someone who's, who's really impactful on Teams, I'd like to have a call with them, because <laughs> very few people are. Um, but this is actually just being aware of how you enter a room and what you bring to it. So I did botch this a few times, times and I'm very sorry, guys. <laughs> I think I actually did uh, apologize a few times. But it's when, you, um, it's when you come to work and you haven't slept well and um, you almost got you know, hit by a cyclist on your way to work and everyone's an idiot and you haven't had breakfast and... <laughs> And you just, you know, just let people know. And then throughout that day, everyone's an idiot and the client's an idiot and your colleagues don't understand it and the lunch is awful and you don't want to be there. Um, and during this project, almost every day, someone had kind of a crisis. And it didn't have to be related to the project. Uh, it could also be something else and a lot of stuff I probably didn't know about. But at least someone always felt like there was something wrong. 
And in the middle of all that, I decided to try and be more aware of how I showed up because I can really bring a room down if, I'm, if I've had a really bad morning. Um, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that person. I, I want to be that person who, um, who people, you know, hope that I am. So I, um, I, tried, I tried doing that and it's, uh, that's actually really hard work in itself. Um, but I don't think I fixed anything too much, but I did actually make it a little easier for myself, just trying to be aware of it. Um, you know, and it's, it's basically just, you know, make that PowerPoint or have that cup of coffee or if you want to tell someone that they're an idiot, just, you know, go to the bathroom and shout it and just come back and talk about something else. Um, but at least to me it worked and just, you know, trying to breathe and trying to remind myself what I wanted to bring and not, you know, the fact that I didn't sleep well last night. So the second thing that I took from this is uh, to just leave it, which I really enjoy. This is by far my favorite thing to do, just leaving things and not doing, maybe that's my, my starter <laughs> gene. Um, early on in the project, uh, I really, I wanted to fix everything. I wanted everyone to feel efficient. I wanted everyone to be really happy um, and I wanted, to be the one who solved all the problems. And um, then I started thinking about, well, who decides if it's a problem? Is that um, the project manager? Is that the designer? Is that the annoying client? Like, who decides even if this is a problem? Is it a problem? Or is it just a question of two people who haven't had a conversation? We had a few examples of that where it was basically people not speaking to each other and then suddenly we have two problems, or at least one and a half. Um, so if I could do this project again, I would, I would just leave more things. I would just let it burn. Most likely there's not even a fire, right? It's just, you know, it'll go away on its own and that's my favorite kind of problem in the whole world. Um, I would, I would pick my battles more, um, um, more, um, I would, pick, my, I would pick, pick better battles actually. And um, you know, I definitely wouldn't enter into pseudo battles or discuss people's non-problems um, that would most likely go away tomorrow. Um, so just, just leave it. And it's actually, once you start leaving things, it becomes really easy. So, so if you just take one thing from today, you know, if you take a, a photo of one slide, just let it be this and just leave it. <laughs> All right, third thing, that's uh, curiosity. And that has made a huge difference to me, uh, just thinking about what, what this means. So I, um, I heard on a podcast that most people's initial response when someone tells them about a problem is to try and fix it. And that is, that is me. I can relate to that. I do that all of the time. Like most times I wouldn't even ask <laughs> about the problem. I would just say, all right, yeah, I know how to fix that. Um, because I was coming from a mindset that says, all right, well, I know, and I can see that you have a problem, so let's just fix it. No big deal. Um, so that was actually quite a revelation to me to, um, to start not doing that and to practice asking questions and being curious about things. Why is this a problem? What happened? Who said what? Well, not, that's not really interesting, but why is it a problem? And what is the best possible outcome? Do you want to fix it? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just want to tell someone about it. Um, so I tried to apply more curiosity and I try to understand, you know, why is someone having some sort of inner drama or why is someone really mad or why is this hard or why is this easy? Um, and to be honest, this has made my job a lot easier. 
because, because basically I don't, I don't have to fix things. So I either leave it or I just ask a bunch of questions. And that's, um, that's awesome. I like that a lot. Um, but it's, um, it's also helped me understand people a lot better because you actually have more conversations when you ask questions and when you're curious about things. Um, I still want to fix things. So if you need anything fixed, come find me today and I will fix it. Um, but it's just not my default every time. Uh, at least I, I, I probably catch it like 30% of the time um, and, and don't jump into fixer mode immediately. But it's actually made a really big difference for prioritizing burning stuff, if you will. This brings us to despair, which is a fun, fun feeling, quite familiar at least to me. Um, so you've got a ton of stuff to do. You've got a crazy client, you haven't slept, uh, maybe your colleagues are unraveling, you certainly are unraveling because you haven't had french fries, you haven't listened to country music for about 48 hours. And this is just really difficult. It's really difficult to ask for help when you're in a situation like this. And this can just snowball into a lot of, um, a lot of different feelings. So personally, um, when I feel like this, and I feel like this quite, quite often actually, I um, fantasize about smoking. I don't smoke anymore, but it just, it seems like such a great stress release. Like, I want to feel like this. Um, I, I, want, I want to go outside and have a smoke. Uh, not, not literally, I don't want to smoke. But, you know, I want that feeling of just leaning back and being like, fuck yes. Um, <laughs> because I can't, do, I, don't, I can't do three vodka shots and just lie down on the floor, which I would do at home. But I need to do something else then. <laughs> Um, so I, I made up some rules because you no know, smoking's not good for you and I had to do something else. Um, so I made up some rules for despair and the first one is that you can, you can pick only one topic, maybe two if it's a really, really rough day, but, but no more. So you'll have to prioritize your feeling of despair. The next one is you have to say it out loud. You don't necessarily have to, you know, tell an actual person. You can just, again, go to the bathroom and say it out loud. It sounds like I spend a lot of time in the bathroom. I don't, I really don't. <laughs> yes, no, I spend an enormous amount of time in the bathroom. Um, and the most important thing is probably ask for help. And that can be really difficult because a lot of the time you don't know what that looks like because you don't know where the feeling of despair comes from. You don't know why this just freaks you out, but you need something. So that can be um, input for that really stupid slide deck that you've been trying to finish for four days. It can be a glass of water. It can be um, one, of those, one of those really bad snacks from the, uh, from the office kitchen. Or it can just be half an hour alone. Or it can be not having to participate in a meeting. So whatever you need, whatever floats your boat, whatever basically gives you room to breathe and just sit with that one despair that you picked for the day, um, I think that's going, to, um, that's going to help. I do all of those things. I even sometimes ask my friends to prioritize what I'm having for dinner because I don't know because I've made a lot of decisions during my day at work. So I don't know if I want pasta or something with vegetables. I, I don't know. So I need someone to decide for me. So I do that. I make someone else decide, which is um, a relief. <laughs> um, and this works for me, might not work for you, but trying to prioritize your overwhelming feelings of despair can at least help you sort through them, I think. Next up is a 
classic. Oh, and by the way, I don't have any quotes today. This could kind of look like a quote. So if you want, I can put a, a fictional name on it and you can, have, you can grab a photo of it afterwards. Um, know what success looks like. And that's different for everyone. And um, a lot of the time, if you ask your boss, success is going to look like um, really high billability, utilization, um, and a really good revenue, like gross margin, yay. Um, and then that's fine. That's also a success for your boss and your bosses, bosses. But sometimes success is also just nobody crying. Success is also just um, doing better than yesterday. And um, other days, it's just nailing that big presentation. And it's just really reeling in all the money and doing the utilization thing. And both are fine. Um, but if you only ever focus on the long-term goal, the long-term success, how much do we need to make from this project? How can we uh, utilize the potential of this client? You know, where we're we going to be in three months? Then you are going to fail a lot of times. You're going to fail almost every day until you don't on that one day when you don't fail. Um, that's not really satisfying, at least if you ask me. Um, so you don't, you don't notice how you're actually doing better than yesterday because you still haven't reached that long-term goal. So I think it's very important to have a think about what does success look like? And it can be different each day. Um, so for example, today for me, because of that calamari surprise that I had Saturday, <laughs> um, <laughs> success today is basically just standing upright. This is also good. So I'm doing that, yay. <laughs> um, but I think it's also important to remember that success does not only look like what your boss says it looks like. And I, I still mean that tomorrow, guys. So <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a lot better. Success is a lot better than what your boss says it is, if you decide what success looks like. All right, so the last thing is, do you know those types of people who always feel a little dramatic. I, I do because I like drama and I'm like, let's just you know, make something up. <laughs> let's be a little dramatic. Um, but it's not, it's not fun for everyone, right? And during this project, I got caught up in that a few times. Someone having a really dramatic day, someone thinking that they heard the client say this, so now we have to reverse everything and they don't want what we thought they wanted. So now we basically have to build something new and we have to do it in two days and we are screwed. Um, so I, I jumped on that wagon and I was like, oh shit, okay. Well, fuck this, let's have a meeting <laughs> and try not to panic. And that's exactly what happened. We had a meeting and we panicked. Um, because, because someone thought they heard something that kind of felt dramatic. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't dramatic. What was dramatic was someone else's feeling of drama that I basically helped apply to an entire team right there. Um, I am not sure I won't do it again. So again, I apologize in advance. <laughs> But I think, to me at least, it's, it's clear that um, you can actually choose not to do that. So what I've taken from that part of the project is that I, I cannot feel someone else's drama. There's simply just not room because I have enough of my own. Um, I want to understand it, but I, just, I cannot feel all of the feelings in this personal drama as well. So I want to ask all the questions and I really want to be on board, but I, I just, um, I, don't, I don't want all the drama. I don't want to be dramatic with you. 
um, because trying to backpedal from someone else's drama, which I basically did for at least two weeks, that's, that's really, really hard work. All right, that's it. That's the talk. Brilliant. Thank you, Eminence. That was fascinating. I feel, I feel like I'm having therapy, actually. I feel like you're like a life coach. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. You mentioned country music a couple of times. Do you have Danish country music? You Probably. To... Yeah, do you? Yeah. Country fan. Are you Dolly Parton fan? I'm not, I'm not a ride or die country fan. Okay, fine. I, just, I, just I, I that like the guitar that, that makes that me... a couple of times. Makes me think about, you know, I could be a country musician. I yeah. could totally do that. You could totally do that. You could do anything, actually, having listened to that. <laughs> um, that was absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm interested, just... A couple of questions before we get into our next speaker. In terms of the COVID app, that was being developed at, you know, it was a, we were in the midst of a storm, the eye of a storm at that point, weren't mm -hmm. we? And I'm fascinated um, that you said that you developed almost like a passport, which almost normalised it for people. What was the response to, of the Danish public to the COVID app? Because it wasn't without controversy here. Mm. Um, and it's a, it, was a, it was a big story when it came here. The hospitality industry wasn't 100% on board. What was the experience in Denmark? Um, well, as I said, we, we trust the authorities. Yeah. Like, oh, and, and by the way, I, I, I didn't develop the app, so please don't hold me accountable. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't, we, we didn't actually have much issues. Uh, really? With that, no, it was adopted really quickly because we, you know, we follow the rules. And if yeah. the rule is you have to see someone's COVID passport before they enter your restaurant, you you look at that passport and you, you can't get in if you interesting if you don't have it. So, so it was fairly without controversy, yes. fairly smooth. Yeah, and fascinating listening to your insights about how you change some of your behaviours. Do you think there's the the chance that we might come out of this a bit kinder eventually, do you think, through yes. the pandemic? Yes, I really, I really do think so. Yeah. And, and what ways and, and what ways do you think people are changing? I mean, I heard your own insights, but are you seeing that in business now that people are a little bit more kinder? Um, I am actually. I think uh, not for this to be sort of a dystopian uh, Q&A, but with everything that's going on, right? We've got yeah, war, yeah. we've got COVID. Yeah. There's just... You know, it's, of course, it's, it's the worst parts of people, but mm. it also brings out the best in people. Mm. So what we're seeing right now is, is I, I think people are a lot kinder because everyone knows that um, it doesn't really matter. Like, yeah. you know, work doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, no, I, I think that's absolutely fascinating. And what for you is the new normal then? Because we've been talking a lot about hybrid working, what the new normal is going to be. What's the new normal going to be, do you think, as we emerge from this? I, I don't actually think there is going to be a new normal. I think we've, we've experienced um, really fluid things, mm. and I think we're going to continue that. But um, I don't know if you noticed, but almost everyone at the two tables where um, the Danish delegation is sitting... Um, did not work from home and did not like working from home. I think we have two people that, yeah. <laughs> who enjoy that. Um, so I think it's actually quite um, Why? individual. Why is that? Is that just an individual? Or? Uh, I don't think... Why, guys, why don't you like working from home? <laughs> <laughs> they're on message, they're on brand, no. Yeah. No, but I think, I think there actually might be a, um, a cultural thing There's as well. There's a social element as well, though, mm. isn't there? Yeah, we're... Um, I think at least in Danish offices, we're quite sort of um, focused on the social part yeah. of work as well. Yeah. Um, and it's not, I mean, Baltic where we work, it's, it's um, can be quite old fashioned. I think at least in the early COVID days, someone um, had the assumption that, that we would go back to normal and that we would just go back to the office. Yeah. Um, but we were not going to. And it's interesting because I'm, I'm fascinated about the, the kind of reaction to the COVID app. Was there a de any degree, because there was here, there's elements of it, there was a suspicion as to how that data would be used. Did you experience any of that in Denmark? Um, I, think a, I think a little, but mm. it's, I think it's because um, uh, it's it mainly... <sighs> Well, mainly with, with people who know a lot about tech. So they're like, yeah, yeah. Right. so we log in with this 
uh, digital signature thing that we have. So how's that going to be used? And who else can see this? And mm. you know, am I going to show my um, my personal ID to the mm. to the guy at the bar? And what's going to happen with that? But um, I think it's also the thing with. Uh, at least the Danish society, when we discuss that, we forget about it quite quickly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you move on. Yeah, we and move it, on and we have that beer and it, you know, it's not really an issue. And is it still being used? Is it still in use in Denmark? No. Oh, it's gone, yes, because it's just about to go here. In fact, yeah. I'm trying to work it. Yeah, midnight, I think it went here. Yeah. So it was used for the, the majority of the pandemic then. How yes. long did it take for, to create? Do you remember the, the, the creation time? That was uh, that was really short. Yeah. So there was this the, the first version that I showed that was sort of yeah, intermediary yeah, yeah. Uh, in another app actually where you could also get your test results. Yeah. Uh, so that one was was uh, up and running from the get go. Was basically just showing your test result. But I think it was, um, I don't know, a couple of months. Wow. That's at incredible, most. wasn't it? Like... Yeah. Two uh, months for a QR code, can you imagine? Uh, pff, no, <laughs> it's incredible. Um, I think I'm going to engage you as a life coach, actually, if you don't mind. Um, I'm very aware of timings. Thank you so much right. for your chat. But, but, but Helen will be around for the rest. Are you here for the two days with your... Yes, I am, and I will fix yes. you for free. So. Yes, yes, absolutely. So <laughs> seek out this wisdom because it's in great, yeah, great demand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you.